Do you have a favourite goal? Uh, I have a favourite goal, yeah, I, <laughs> but it's different from my best goal. Okay. That feeling when that ball hit the back of the net and the crowd, I can still remember mm. now when I talk about it, I can still remember the noise that the crowd made when that, when that went in and that was, a, that was an unbelievably special moment. How much did you feel you had to prove after being out the side for a few games? Um, I think, I don't think I've got anything to prove to the manager. I mean, he knows what I'm capable of playing like. I just wasn't playing like that before, uh, before he dropped me. You were the most loyal player to Southampton. So, why did you stay at Southampton, despite all the transfer offers from all these, all these clubs? Yeah, um, it's a good question. I kind of knew where it was all going, where right. it was all heading, um, but it was too important not to say stuff. You know, I knew that I was, uh, you know, crossing a line really. Uh, I was criticising the mainstream media and that included Sky News obviously. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I never really immersed myself into that, into that world of media. So I would go in literally on a, on a Saturday morning. So the only time I would ever go to Sky was to, to do Soccer Saturday. I never went to the office up there. I would just go in on a Saturday morning. I get picked up, driven to the studios. We literally walked in, had about an hour before the show where we had a chat with all the all the guys uh, did the show and as soon as the show finished I was in my car and I, I drive back home. So when was it that you started to notice uh, things weren't right regardless of obviously the government or mainstream media or anything? Quite early on, uh, yeah. probably February, early March 2020, late February, early March. Um, could kind of see what was building in the media and we're kind of I'd obviously Having worked in that industry for a while, you start to see signs. Football is a, for for people who go and watch. It's an escape, exactly, from yeah. everything that else that's going on in their lives. It's yeah. their escape. You know, they don't need to be indoctrinated no. when they go into football matches. Um, it, and, and I completely disagree with what the Premier League have done. Yeah. Um, Mate. <laughs> How you doing, mate? You're right. Yeah, good. How are Come you? Come on in. Yeah, welcome. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much. Welcome to Hampshire. Yeah. <laughs> I'll tell you what. It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. Very tucked out of the way. Thank you, mate. Yeah, it's nice to nice little quiet part of the world. Yeah, absolutely. As I step into yeah. the world of legendary footballer Matt Letizia, I'm struck by the contrast between fame that surrounds yeah. Matt and the humble beginnings that shaped his uh, extraordinary journey. Special pieces, so that oh, was my- Fantastic. Uh, England versus that. Italy, that was my last England cap, one of the shirts from that game. 97, England versus Italy. Yeah, lost one nil, unfortunately. <laughs> okay. I blame Ian Walker. Oh yeah. <laughs> Let it in his near post. <laughs> Just kidding, Walker. Uh, and then my uh, England cap's at the top That's there. That's fantastic. 94. Yeah, I was born in 94. Don't make me feel old. No, sorry, no, that wasn't intentional <laughs> at all. Yeah. Fantastic. So, yeah, very proud of those. Would have been yeah. nice to have a few more, but yeah. yeah, take what you get. Take what you get. Well, we'll have a conversation about that for sure. Yeah. And then, and my, then last you've ever, got... my last ever goal for Southampton. Yeah. A guy did a lovely painting of it and, uh, yeah, let me have it. So, let's have a look at that. I want to get like a, I want to get up close to that, actually. That's. It was a pretty decent effort. Yeah, absolutely. You miss it, don't you? Well, not now. No, no. <laughs> it's too long ago now. No, okay. Uh, this is an interesting bit of memorabilia, actually. This is one of my more fascinating pieces of, of memorabilia. So this is a oh, check. Oh, wow. This is Matthew Harding, who was the Chelsea director, who died in a plane crash. Uh, 97, I think it was. So this is in 1994. Right. Uh, no, 95, 1995. Wow. And Chelsea wanted to buy me. And he was the uh, the director at Chelsea and he made a phone call to Laurie McMenemy and said, we want to buy Matt Letizia. Laurie was director of football at Southampton. And Laurie said, well, we don't want to sell him. And Laurie said, well, in fact, the only way Matt Letizia will ever be your player is if you buy Southampton Football Club. Okay. So Matthew Harding turned around and he went, oh, that's a good idea. He said, I could buy them and then change their name to Chelsea on Sea. No which way! Is what, which is what the check is made out for. Wow! Chelsea on Sea, £7 million. Time by Matthew Hardy. Wow! 
And uh, Laurie kept this check all these years, and then he gave it to me a few years ago and said that. No way. Yeah. I bet that was a, a blast from the past. Yeah, it was. Yeah, wow. But do you know how frustrating it is to have that sat in your Yeah, office? I know. Yeah, I can imagine now, like <laughs> no, looking at it. it. <laughs> Especially in these Especially times. what's happened the last few years. Yeah, yeah. Well, absolutely. Oh, so, man. Yeah, that was my England B shirt from uh, what I scored a hat trick at Loftus Road against, against Russia. Russia B in 1998. Yeah. This one's a pretty cool one, actually. In uh, 2013, I was inducted into the National Football Museum Hall of Fame. Pretty cool thing to have on your uh, on your CV. Before the madness yeah. started to occur. Uh, yeah, I'm surprised they haven't taken it off me. <laughs> <laughs> Retracted. Yeah, absolutely. Too controversial. Yeah. <laughs> In the realm of footballing legends, few names are as revered as his. Today, we will take a closer look, not just at the headlines and accolades, but at the very essence of a man who left an indelible mark on the sport. Furthermore, his courage to speak out against the government and mainstream media narratives, which unfortunately the consequences for doing this was his career at Sky Sports. In this exclusive interview, I sit down with Matt Letissier to have a conversation about his career as a football icon, to what happened at Sky Sports, and what life is like after he spoke out against governmental and mainstream media narratives. Matt, thank you so much. No for problem. Taking your time, time out for this. It's been a long time coming. First time meeting as well. So, thank nice you. One. You're welcome, mate. I thought we'd start off with your football career. Sure. Uh, I have, like I mentioned earlier to you off camera, I've got some facts and statistics. So okay. obviously, correct me if uh, if any of these. I are will. Wrong. If you've been on Wikipedia, I'll no, have to. no. Oh no, I wouldn't do Wikipedia. <laughs> Definitely not. Uh, so according to a site called Transfer Market, okay. um, throughout your entire time with Southampton, including Premier League, First Division in 91-92, FA Cup and the EFL Cup, you made 450 appearances. 540. 540. 540 in total. Yeah. Um, 166 goals, according to them, but uh, it will be a bit more than that. 209 goals altogether. So these are all wrong, so that's a great start <laughs> to the interview. Um, your first goal was in 1986. It was. November the 4th. November the 4th, yeah. Southampton v United. United. League Cup. 4-1. And yeah, it was... Came on as a substitute. And it was less than a month after your 18th birthday? It, that's correct, yeah. 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 In the second half, United were looking increasingly vulnerable, and some weak defending let in Wallace to put Southampton two up. And it was three after Letitia's lob beat Turner. By now, United were in total disarray, and from Casey's corner, it was the young man from the Channel Islands, Letitia, who made it four. Yeah, all those things are true, and what a lot of people don't understand about that game as well is that uh, I came on and scored two. Uh, we won 4-1 and Ron Atkinson was the Manchester United manager at the time and he was sacked after that game. Man United fans really got a lot to thank me for because yeah. they then <laughs> went and appointed for Alex Ferguson and look what happened. <laughs> there you go. And you're the first midfielder to score 100 goals in the English Premier League. Yeah. First nice. ever. Nice accolade, yeah. Yeah, very good. Yeah, pretty cool. And your last competitive goal at the Dell Stadium it was in 2001, yep. uh, which was a 3-1 victory against Arsenal. 3-2. 3-2. Why are they... <laughs> what a great start to the... 17 minutes left. Proof that there is still room in football for sentiment. On comes Matt Letizia for this final game at the Dell. For stoppage time. Here's Letizia! I'm right in saying they demolished the stadium they did. And then later there was a housing estate was built on top and yes. they renamed flats and it. Apartments. Yeah. Letitia Court. One of the one of the blocks of flats on there is yeah. Letitia Court. Yeah, so that's yeah. pretty cool as well. Well that's definitely right. That, that was um, right. That's definitely I've, right. I've seen that. That's okay that one. <laughs> you never moved club at all. Nope. You stayed with Southampton for sixteen years? Sixteen years as a professional, yeah, and yeah. a year and a bit as a as an apprentice. Yeah. Or and, on the um, YTS scheme as it was back then. That's it, YTS £26 scheme. £26 a week. Yeah. I mean, Happy we're, <laughs> we're going to get on to wages and things like that in terms of how it is now and mm. how it's affected the sport. But um, that's mad when you look back. 
you still currently hold the second place as the best penalty taker uh, in the Premier League history with 25 out of 26 mm -hmm. goals scored at a conversion rate of 96.2%. Yeah. Was it 47 out of 48? Yeah. Oh, it says here, on a scale of 1 to 10, how much do you hate Mark Crossley? <laughs> <laughs> Carl Tyler spotted pulling back Nicky Banger. Matthew Letizia, always dependable from the spot, took the responsibility. But Mark Crossley took the honours, went the right way and saved superbly. Do you know what? If, if I could have picked one goalkeeper to have saved my penalty, it probably would have been Mark. He's a top <laughs> bloke. I actually get on really well with him. Oh, that's good. So, yeah, we're all good. <laughs> you are the most loyal player to Southampton. So, why did you stay at Southampton, despite all the transfer offers from all these all these clubs? Yeah, I mean, it's a good question. Um, and at different times, it was for different reasons. Mm. Um, so I nearly joined Spurs when I was 21. Uh, that was the closest I ever came to leaving Southampton. That was my team as a boy. I was a Spurs fan. Mm -hmm. At that point, I was just about to get married. Um, and my fiancé at the time didn't want to go live in London. So I had to choose between getting married and, or joining Spurs. Uh, so I got married and then six years later I got divorced. Um, uh, and then kind of 1995, Chelsea was the other really serious offer. Um, and at that point, I was really enjoying my football at Southampton. Yeah. Um, you know, I had a great manager who was uh, Alan Ball. I just had the best period of my career under him. Mm. And I didn't feel like I needed to move. I was. I was doing everything. I was living the dream, you know. Yeah. I was the the top bloke in the team. I was scoring all the goals. I was, um, I was, didn't see any reason to disrupt that. Your fans, because you were so loyal, nicknamed you Le God. Mm. Yeah, they did. That's an interesting one. Yeah. Um, What's your reaction to all that? Ah, do you know what? I, I I take everything with a pinch of salt. Really, when it comes to that kind of stuff, I've yeah, always yeah. kind of kept my feet on the ground and not got carried away by. Um, the adulation of being a professional footballer for me it was just something I was good at mm. something I wanted to do as a as a job um, you know I've, I've always said if, if you can if you can go to work and uh, and do your hobby as your mm. as your job and get paid for it then it really kind of isn't work um, mm. and, I, and that's kind of how I felt about my football career I never felt like I had to get up and go to work and that's a pretty special place to be because we were talking earlier um, you say it didn't feel like work at all. Never did. Yeah. Never did. I mean, it was. I mean, it was awkward at times. You know, Christmas morning having to go in training when everyone else is. Yeah. You know, sat opening their presents and things and the little things like that about it. But you know, it, it was just your life. That was your life, and I, I didn't know anything different from when I left school at sixteen. Going yeah. Straight to Southampton, and you know, I was in the first team just over a year later. Um, and yeah, that that was it for the next. 16 years. And that didn't affect you in any way for the whole having to wake up on Christmas Day and missing maybe Well, I mean, you got, to, you got to see the kids open the presents first before you went off and, and yeah. it was only for a couple of hours, you know, and you'd be back again for, for lunch. So it was, uh, it, it was okay. It was just one of those things you had to do as a professional footballer. Yeah. You know, we had a game the next day, yeah. so you had to prepare properly for it. You know, that's why you're called professionals. Looking back, you turned down is it Glenn Hoddle and um, Venables? Yep. When they uh, advanced you to try and purchase you um, for their respective clubs. I was going to ask you, do you think that played a part in why they didn't play you more for England? Yeah, yeah no, I mean, obviously Terry was manager at Spurs in, in 1991. I turned down and Glenn at, at Chelsea in 95. But yeah, they, they both went on to become England managers pretty soon after that. And, and perhaps looking back, you know, those decisions maybe did cost me a little bit of goodwill mm -hmm. maybe from the from the managers uh obviously the only people that can answer that are, are terry and glenn sure you know honestly in their hearts they're the only ones that can that can do that but it was i i found it really odd you know when you look back now uh in the 1994-95 season uh i ended up scoring 30 goals that season yeah and during that season towards the back end of it i was left out of the england squad yeah now i was playing in midfield at the time now, if you look at it, if you look at it now, if you had somebody, an English player, scoring thirty goals from midfield in the Premier League right now, not only would he be worth about two hundred million quid, but he'd be the first pick in every England team. Of course, yeah. Um, and when I look back, I go, what? What was that all about then? Why? Why was yeah. I dropped? You know, I was playing some probably the best football of my life. You know, um, 
And so, yeah, that, that was kind of frustrating because I, I really wanted to play in the World Cup. I wanted to play in the European Championships. Never got the chance to do it. Well, I was going to ask you, do you wish you had and, you know, been picked a lot more? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I'm very proud of the eight caps that I do have, yeah. um, obviously, because as a kid growing up in Guernsey, you know, yeah. it's a pretty lofty ambition to want to, to want to play for your country. No Guernsey men had ever played for England before. No. So um, to have done that is a, you know, I'm very proud of that achievement. But yes, obviously, I think every, every player who played international football would go, oh, I wish I'd have had a few more caps. Do you have a favourite goal? Uh, I have a favourite goal, yeah, I, <laughs> but it's different from my best goal. Okay. Um, so my best goal I scored against Blackburn in yeah. 1994. That one won the, the goal of the season that year. Um, but my, my favourite goal, I think, was uh, the picture that's in my office. Yeah. Um, scoring the last ever league goal at the Dell was a pretty special moment. Um, that kind of that game was just something that was just really, it was really weird. I had this this unbelievable feeling that I would be the one that scored the last goal at the nice. Dell, you know, after everything that had gone on. Uh, but that season that we finished at the Dell had been a really bad one for me. You know, I'd been injured a lot during it. Mm. Um, I hadn't scored a Premier League goal all season. Uh, and that goal, I came on a sub with like 12 minutes to go, game stood at two all, it was the winning goal in the 88th minute, you know, all that stuff. And it was a pretty decent finish as well. It wasn't like a, a run of the mill tapping. Um, and so that feeling when that ball hit the back of the net and the crowd, I can still remember mm. now when I talk about it, I can still remember the noise that the crowd made when that when that went in. And that was, a, that was an unbelievably special moment. So that's my favorite goal, not my best one. Here's Letizia. They say it's the, the one of the biggest highs ever. Uh, well, I've never taken story. drugs, no. right? So I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. I couldn't compare it. No. But I can only imagine yeah. that the the adrenaline rush that you get when yeah. something like that happens is, I guess, is kind of similar to what to what you get from that <laughs> stuff. But honestly, to to score a goal, especially when it's yeah. a decent one. Uh, and it's a winning goal, a couple yeah. of minutes from the end, you know, the crowd are all kind of, and the noise that it makes, just the hairs on the back of your neck. Yeah, oh, it's bet. just like, oh, it's just an amazing feeling. What do you make of Southampton now in 2023? If you could... Uh... As a football team? Yes. Um, it's, been, it's been a disappointing two or three years, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've, we've kind of stagnated a little bit. Um, Paid the price ultimately, I guess, eventually for having to, to keep selling the, the better players that we've mm -hmm. had. Um, and I guess that's the frustrating thing with being a club the size of Southampton is that when you do get a decent team together, you only really get one shot at it. Yeah. You, you get one season and then if you have a great season, all the big boys come, cherry pick your best players. Mm. That's, that's the way of the world. I mean, ultimately, 99% of all football clubs are selling clubs. Yeah just at different levels along the way. Sure. So, um, you know, we've had some great seasons when Ronald Koeman was here, mm -hmm. um, you know, um, Pochettino had a, had a good season here. You know, we finished four seasons in a row in the top eight, which for a club of our size was pretty special to keep doing that and selling players at the same time mm. and replenishing well. That's what we did for a few years. Uh, over the last few years, I think the recruitment has probably not been quite as good as what it was a few years back. And that's why we're in the position we're in now. If you could make changes to Southampton now, what would uh, what would be your changes? If I could make changes. Um, obviously, the, the people in charge at the moment actually have, have funded the club pretty well. You know, last season when we got relegated, it was actually a season where we spent the most money in our history. Mm. So you can't fault the owners for putting their hands in their pockets. Uh, I would probably... I think the biggest thing that you can have at a football club now is to have the right person in place in terms of the recruitment. Yeah. Sure. <clears throat> so I think if you get the best recruiter in the world, that's the thing that I would want at Southampton Football Club was the, the bloke who's right at the top of his game in terms of recruitment because that's kind of what makes our club work. I think I was chatting to a mate, massive Southampton fan, so I was telling you earlier, he's very jealous that I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and he was, he was explaining how the, the youth club um, pumps out all these amazing sort of players mm. 
um, currently, and it's it's a very valuable um, section of the club. Yep. Um, so you, I don't think there'd be any changes then for for that at all. Um, yeah, maybe. Possibly. I mean, we have had you know some real superstars that have come through the club down yeah. the years. We likes of, of Gareth Bale and Theo Walcott, Luke Shaw, yeah. all those kind of. I mean, there's, there's plenty more that I can name, but it's um, the last probably the last couple of years we haven't quite had that that massive superstar that, that's come through. So we're we're probably maybe a, a little bit behind in where we used to be in that department. So again, but th- football's very cyclical. It will go and it will come back again. We'll get good players come through. Mm. We've got a big catchment area here. You know, um, if you're talking about clubs on the South Coast, you know, and Bournemouth are in the Premier League at the moment, but if Southampton as a, as a whole, as a football club, mm. uh, has far better facilities, um, you know, it's a far more attractive proposition, I think, to, to young kids coming through for their career yeah. prog- progression and all that kind of stuff. So mm. we're still in a good place, but we're just at the moment, we're, we've got a tough season ahead of us in the championship and, uh, and hopefully we can, we can get ourselves back up in the Premier League. Speaking about um, transfers and you know, wages and things like that in, in modern football, I mean, I read a few days ago that Neymar's transfer was 90 million euros. Every week he's raking in, I think, like 2 million or something a week or something something like that. <laughs> um, and he still holds the highest record of the most expensive transfers, which was 2017, at 222 million euros, which, Bonkers. Is, which is about 200 million pounds. Do you think these wages, um, do you think they're killing the sport? Uh, I certainly think they are not doing the sport any favours. Mm. Uh, I think it's probably affecting, I think, the relationship between the club, the f- players and the fans, mm. which is, you know, the disparity in the wages is just so massive. Yeah. You know, when I was, when I was playing, our wages were, were good, but they weren't kind of out of the reach of the, of the normal bloke, yeah. you know? Um, certainly not in the early days. I mean, my first professional contract that I signed in 1986 uh, was a hundred pound a week. Yeah, yeah. You know, and okay, in 1986, that's you know, okay. Yeah. yeah, but it wasn't extraordinary. It wasn't. It was probably less than what a lot of people outside of football were earning back mm-hmm. then. Mm-hmm. So um, what's happened, I think, has just put a little gap between you know the fans and the players and, and they just seem a bit not part of the community anymore. We were very much a part of the community in my yeah. day. Um, Do you think that sense of community exists now with the players? Or are they- I don't touch? get that feeling. I don't get that, I don't. that same feeling. No, I, I, don't. I really don't. I think you know the players are now kept apart from the fans as, as much as they can. You know, it's crazy to think now, but in, in our day, we had a training ground, same training ground as where Southampton train now, mm. but it was completely open to the public. Any day, that anybody could walk up and watch us train any day of the week. And it was brilliant. Yeah. You know, in the half term, the kids were on holiday, we get loads of kids coming up and watch us training. It was good fun. We'd all sign autographs afterwards. And now it's like, Geez, like, like trying to trying to get into Fort Knox, trying yeah, to get into yeah. the training ground now. If you're yeah. a member of the public, you like you just don't get a, a chance to do that. And I, yeah. I don't really think that's sad. Really, I, I think it's a bit sad that that connection between the, the club and the fans has has been severed a little bit. Yeah, here's the Tizian. Oh, lovely skills. Oh, he's almost unstoppable. Oh, marvelous goal. The Tizian second. An absolute dream. I know it's despite the fact that Southampton have pulled them from time to time all over the place, have gamely kept battling. Letizier's away here, a chance of a hat trick. Can he finish it? Oh, beautifully. So f- for me, um, I've, I'll be honest with you, I've stopped watching. Um, but the reason why I stopped watching football is not just with the wages and, and you know, the, the, the disparity between that, but it's the politics. The wokeness of it all. Yes. The taking the knee, all that nonsense. Exactly. Yeah. Um, I get that. I was going to say, do you share the same view? Yeah, I, I just think football needs to take a step back, doesn't need to get involved in, in that kind of stuff. Football is, a, for, for people who go and watch, it's an escape. 
exactly from yeah. everything that else that's going on in their lives it's yeah. their escape you know they don't need to be indoctrinated no. when they go into football matches um it, and, and i completely disagree with what the premier league have done yeah um and that because of that i'll probably never ever get in the premier league hall of fame but do you know what i don't really care um it's for me football should be about getting away from everything else I in your agree. life yeah. Go and enjoy. Go and be entertained. Yeah. You know, don't be don't be brainwashed by political messages that yeah. the players are giving you with their rainbow armbands and yeah. they're taking the knees. It's just, I, I it just drives me mad. And yes, it's put a, it's left a sour taste in my mouth for the sport that I love. No sooner had they knelt than it began. The sound of booing echoing around the den before the match against Derby County. I think a lot of fans are sort of feeling that way as well. I mean, especially with me, I, I used to follow it quite a lot. And now I just don't, I mean, I try and watch Formula One and that is difficult because you've got spray painted on the side, net zero by 2030 and they're driving around <laughs> Yeah. and you've got Lewis <laughs> Hamilton endorsing just stop oil, uh, you know, when they get on the track. It's so unreal, it's, isn't it? It's difficult. It's weird. Um, because like you say, it's an escape. You want to, you want, when you watch sport. Sport should be escapism. Yeah, absolutely. Sport, you know, you should, yeah. be, you should just sit there and want to be entertained by people who are really good at what you're watching. You know, exactly. the, the top people. And no, it's as simple as that. And politics needs to get the hell out of sport. I agree. I agree. Phones on silent? Yeah, phones on silent is really important. Yes. So I can hear mine going. The only one that's not allowed to. The only one whose phone goes off during live transmission is the presenter. I've got. Um... You're a pundit on Sky Sports. I was. There are so many headlines now about your time there um, and why you were let go, and Sky Sports weren't exactly truthful about why you were let go at first. Could you explain to the viewers what happened? Um, yeah, I, um, when COVID kicked off in, in March 2020, I was kind of asking questions about what was really going on. Mm. Um, I was kind of um, going against the mainstream narrative. Um, and I don't think that was going down particularly well with my employers. Mm -hmm. uh, so I had a couple of warnings from them. Okay. Um, I was also when the George Floyd thing yeah. <laughs> all kicked off, uh, we were asked, or I say asked, we were told we should wear Black Lives Matter badges on the, on the show. Sure. And I'd looked into this organisation uh, a, a few weeks earlier and I wasn't really comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. And we were, we were told about 30 seconds before we were due to go on air, I'd give you this badge and go and put that on. And I, I looked at the producer and I went, do I have to put that on? Uh, and he looked at me and he went, it's in your best interest if you do. And I was like, oh, uh, okay. And they're like, we were literally going on air. So I, so I put it on. And then I was like really uncomfortable all afternoon. I just didn't, didn't feel comfortable with that on at all. So at the end of the show, I, I took it off. I went to see the producer and I went, look, I said, you can have this back. I said, I will never be wearing that badge again. I said, if you want me to put another badge on, kick racism out, all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm, I'm all good with that. I said, but I would never wear that again. Uh, mm. And I don't think that, that went down very well. No. Um, I was then <laughs> questioning when they were trying to get the season back up and running. Um, I, I put a tweet out um, because they were doing testing amongst all the mm -hmm. players and the staff of football clubs. Mm. And then every week they'd do an announcement of how many positive tests there were. Uh, and the Premier League would do this announcement, but they wouldn't say where the tests were. Um, and the only way you could find out who was testing positive is if the club themselves came out and went, yes, that's us. So all the clubs were coming out and going, oh, yeah, that's us. That they're, Those four cases are ours. And the only clubs that were coming out and doing that were the clubs right in the Premier League relegation zone or just above it. So, oh, right. So they didn't want the season to start again. Got you. Because if the season gets annulled, they start again in the Premier League. Funny that. All the money again for next season. <laughs> And so I just put out a tweet saying, isn't it strange how the only clubs that are admitting to having COVID cases are the ones that are in the relegation zone or just above it? Interesting. All right, so I, that was all I did. So 
So I got a phone call from the uh, head of football at, at Sky. And he went, uh, he said, Matt, he said, we had a complaint about your tweet. <laughs> oh, gosh. And I went, all right, which one? <laughs> he said, because there was a few to choose from. <laughs> and he went, uh, what about the, um, the clubs admitting to the COVID cases? He said, we've had a complaint from one of the chief executives at one of the football clubs. Didn't like it. And I went, I said, oh, that's interesting. I said, have you got the tweet there, Gary? He said, uh, he said yeah. I said, can you read it to me? So he read it to me and I went, right. I said, is there anything factually incorrect about that tweet? And he, he paused for a second and he went, uh, <laughs> no. <laughs> I went, right. So what, what was the problem again? Yeah. He went, well, that's not really the point. We've had a complaint. I went, oh. okay, you might have had a complaint. I said, but it's actually true what I've written. So mm. I'm not taking it down. I said, so um, he's going to have to deal with that, whoever it is. I don't know who it was, but uh, he's going to have to deal with it because it's true. And if he's got guilty conscience, that's on him. Yeah, and absolutely. That was it. So, and then a few weeks later, I was sacked. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, uh, well, an added bonus for that. Yeah. You have Come to on. get an idea. Well, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm happy. It's horses, Dougie, Dougie, Dougie. Extra thousand pounds is on its way. Extra shut up, Jeff. That's six six thousand pounds. And by the way, Dougie, you got one wrong. From the outside looking in, that sort of world, media, television. I mean, that must be a pretty bonkers world. Um, well, Especially with yourself speaking out against yeah, the I mean, narratives. I mean, I was, yeah, I mean, I was, I kind of knew where it was all going, where right. it was all heading. Um, mm. But it was too important not to say stuff. You know, I knew that I was, uh, you know, crossing a line, really. Uh, I was criticising the mainstream media, and that included Sky News, obviously. Yeah. Um, but I, I, I never really immersed myself into that, into that world of media. So I would go in literally on a, on a Saturday morning. So the only time I would ever go to Sky was to, to do Soccer Saturday. I never went to the office up there. I would just go in on a Saturday morning. I get picked up, driven to the studios. We literally walked in, had about an hour before the show where we had a chat with all the, all the guys, uh, did the show. And as soon as the show finished, I was in my car and I, I drive back home. So I, I never got involved in the politics up there. No. I did nothing. I just went, did my job, came home. Yeah. You know, and I, and I didn't get involved in anything else up there. You know, and that's kind of that suited me. That's that's just the way I want to live my life. That's my job. I go and do it. I come back home. And, and I, so, I tell you what, that's probably the best way in mm, that kind of world. Yeah, and that's that's how I survived for so long in that world because I just didn't get involved in stuff. I just went did my job, came home, tried and do my job as diligently as possible, be as honest as possible with my opinions, um, and you know that's just who I am and what I do. Is it right? Because I remember you said something about you were uh, let go for being a, a straight white male. Is that correct? Uh, so when I was um, when I got the Zoom call to uh, for the sacking, mm. um, the official verdict was that uh, we're taking the show in a different direction with the words it. they That's actually they said, with, yeah. with the words they actually used, um, which was untrue. Which was. Untrue, yeah, it was untrue. Um, but you know, they've obviously since uh, Comcast took over, mm -hmm. um, they did go very much down the route of the you know diversity and all that kind of stuff. And yeah. and I guess having five middle-aged white blokes on a TV program on a Saturday afternoon didn't suit what they were trying to do, so they changed it up. And that's their prerogative; it's their money. They can do whatever they want. Who came to your defence? When that happened, not, are you... not many, <laughs> not many. Certainly not as many as it came to the defence of Gary Lineker. Yeah, uh, well. you know, I mean, that that was an interesting, uh, <laughs> interesting watch to see all his lackeys jumping to his defence and yeah. threatening to go on strike. Um, you know, but hey, that's classic, that's, isn't it? That's the classic when you're on the right side of the uh, uh, of the narrative, or or on the left, if you like. Yeah, um, it's okay. You know, you get away with all that stuff. Well, yeah, they say if it's, you it's, parrot the establishment's narrative, then you're safe. Absolutely. It's not a level playing field. No. no. And you can do stuff, get away with it, and have a second coming, you know, even if, you, even if you're found out. 
you'll get another chance and they'll wheel you back out. And it's quite remarkable. When Gary Lineker was asked yesterday whether he stood by his tweet comparing the language used to launch the government's new asylum policy with 1930s Germany, he said he did. Do you stand by what you said in your tweet? Of course. Thank you. Lineker added yesterday, well, it's been an interesting couple of days. Happy that this ridiculously out of proportion story seems to be abating and very much looking forward to presenting match of the day on Saturday. Is there anyone you wish that came to your defence when it happened? Not really. I'm a big no. boy. I can deal with stuff. It's fine. <laughs> I'm, listen, it, what's happened has happened. I don't have any regrets about it. Uh, I would do the same thing again. Um, yeah. No problem about that. I've, you know, made a, a different life for myself now um, mm. uh, and one that is uh, much better for not having to um, tell people that I work in the media. Yeah. Because, you know, certainly the mainstream media, because I think that has now become an embarrassment. There were four of you. Yeah. At that, at the sack. Uh, three. Three? Yeah, three out of the four. Three out of the four of us went, yeah. So That's Paul right. Merson escaped the chop and, uh, oh, yeah. and me, Phil Thompson and Charlie Nicholas all went on the same day. Yeah. You guys still get along really well? Yeah yeah, 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 yeah. We still all do um, gigs together. You know, Good. we've got a theatre show next month in oh, Wolverhampton. So uh, we all get together occasionally and it's great fun and we have a laugh. That's, that's, that's great. Life. No, that's great. So when was it that you started to notice uh, things weren't right, regardless of obviously the government or mainstream media or anything? Quite early on, um, yeah. probably February, early March 2020, late February, early March. Um, could kind of see what was building in the media and what kind of, I obviously having worked in that industry for a while, you start to see signs um, mm. and started seeing things. Uh, and I was thinking, oh, hang on a minute, something's, something's not, not quite right here. I, I spoke to a couple of doctors, friends of mine in, in, in the village actually, who'd seen the data early on from, mm. from COVID and they both said, well, it appears that it's actually only for for young, healthy people. It says it's not going to be really of consequence at all. It's, this is just going to affect the really elderly people or people who are already ill. That's it, yeah. um, and this was like late February 2020. I was being told this, and then at the because I think they had all the uh, data from the Diamond Princess cruise ship. Yeah. Um, so very early on, I was like, oh, okay. So I, it didn't frighten me. So I, I kind of um, knew early on. And then I started reading up on some, some bits. I can't remember the first thing I saw, but uh, somebody sent me a link to the uh, documentary series, The Fall of the Cabal. Okay. Um, and I started watching this series and I, I was like, oh my God. Wow, it, it just, it blew my mind. I was like, Everything, I, it just seems like everything I've been told since I was little is actually not true. Not true. Um, you know, it's, it was just bizarre. I was thinking it, was, it went through like a lot of history of the royal family and all that kind of sure. stuff and uh, secret societies sure. and, all, and all those things. And you're like, blimey, really? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and even at that point though, even at that point, I was like, I don't know, I, I've got to keep a balance on this. This, you know, sure. this might be, this might not be right. Mm -hmm. Let's see how things pan out and, you know, and as things then started progressing and panning out with the lockdowns coming in and all sorts of things, I'm thinking, well, hang on a minute. Mm. There, there's something, yeah, my little bullshit meter was going <laughs> through the roof. I was like, well, okay, this is not right. And that's why I, I decided early on I, I was going to be the, one of the people, one of the few people early on that we're going to go against the narrative and, and start questioning things and, yeah. and try to just plant seeds in people really to try and make them um, try and make them think yeah. really. I think that's kind of been the whole premise of what I've been doing for the last few years yes. is not necessarily trying to get people to come around to my way of thinking No, because but I don't know if I'm right. right. I don't know if I'm 100% right. You know, I might be right on some things, I might be wrong on some things. But what I've always tried to encourage people to do is to is to 
listen to both sides of the story yes and then make up your own mind so what really annoyed me is that we weren't being given both sides of the story we were just given one narrative the whole time we've been battered with it 24 hours a day through the television and the radio and that for me was not was not right and that's why i've encouraged people to just try and think for themselves i put out a different perspective out there um, you know, and that doesn't always mean that I agree with that perspective. Sure. But I, I think people should be aware that there are two sides to every story. We were, we were taught that as kids. And you should be able to hear both sides of those before making your mind up. And that's what we weren't being done. And that's what really frustrated me. You've, uh, you've asked for a proper investigation into what is going on here. Um, I, take it, I take it you just suddenly noticed that there were footballers and boxers and rugby players dying more often than they should be? Uh, very much so, uh, Mark. I've um, been involved in sport all my life. Uh, not only that, um, I, I watch a hell of a lot of sport. It's pretty much the only thing I watch on the television. Um, and I have seen so many people, so many incidents of young, fit, healthy sports people collapsing on their fields of play. And it's it's just not normal and yet the media seem to be normalizing it and nobody seems to be paying any attention whatsoever to this huge rise that has gone on and for for the authorities in charge uh, of these sports to not notice it or not to be calling for an investigation uh, i think is absolutely scandalous and it's almost um well in the age where free speech is basically on its knees mm. and it's it's now compelled speech uh, where people are now being arrested uh, for tweets yeah. for saying mean Crazy. things. Crazy um, world. What's your reaction to that? It's it's it, it's mental. Is what is what my reaction to it is. Mm. Uh, you know, you can get get arrested for saying hurty words. Yeah. And yet, I tell you what, go and rob a house. Yeah. And see if you get caught. Because <laughs> if do you know the statistics on how many people. They're actually low. prosecuted for burglaries. Very low. It is in single figures. It mm. is unbelievably low. And yet the police have got time to go and arrest somebody for saying a hurty thing with their tweets. Yeah. Honestly, it just drives me mad. The, the whole speech thing mm. is really insidious. Yeah. What they're trying to do to police your speech is... Uh, uh, people don't kind of understand just what the the dangers of that actually are in the yeah. future. The dangers are extreme and people are going to have to wake up pretty quick because they're trying to bring in laws that are going to you know, put you in a position where you're not going to be able to say what you think anymore. Well, they say the boot always tastes good from the authoritarian when it's in your favour. Mm, exactly. So I think we're seeing a lot of that. Going back to um, what woke you up or what um what you saw that you thought mm, that doesn't look right mm. so mine was the bbc when they were doing the the death toll and they were rolling the numbers but they were saying 28 days Brilliant. after yeah i think you, that was a, that was another thing a lot of people yeah a lot of people suddenly went hang on a minute they're yeah. counting it as a computer. yeah you could literally get run over by a bus yeah and it will count as but a... You, but 28 days ago, you had a, co a positive COVID test with a PCR test, which, by the way, is fraudulent. Yeah, fraudulent. Um, yeah. And yet that was counted as a COVID test. So the deliberate inflation of the numbers was one of the big things that woke a lot of people up. I think. Yeah. What's funny is because I was around a friend's, uh, which wasn't allowed at the time, believe it or not. And I can't believe that we were in a stage where that actually happened. But I remember three of us watching that and I was the only one who, who went, that's not, that's not right. But when I tried to explain it to them, they sort of went, oh yeah, that isn't right. Anyways, and then just carried, and on. carried and, on. And I think that's, I think that mindset of, it's like a wall of ideology. You can't seem to push through. Yeah. Are there anyone within like Sky Sports or that sort of world that think the same? Uh, yes, uh, there have been. And I was on, um, Early on, we kind of uh, got involved with a few names that were all kind of thinking the same thing. We had, we, we had a WhatsApp group really? uh, okay. to support each other. That's cool. Um, and 
yeah, it was interesting. A couple of people joined that group who were working at Sky, who still are working at Sky. Really? Uh, who joined the group, but very quickly left the group. Really? Okay. So they were threatened with their jobs, I would imagine. Uh, and basically went from being a skeptic to shutting up because they wanted to keep their job, basically. For simply having a different opinion? Yep, for simply having a different opinion. That is the world we live in and it's a scary one and, and most people don't really seem too bothered about it, which is a bit frustrating. I, I even remember when growing up when I was, you know, like 17, 18, when you're at score six form or whatever, in politics lesson, everyone like if you had a different opinion, you were able to share it. There was no, yeah, there was no such thing as cancel culture or no. anything like that. Even for me, and I'm, well, I'm 29 at the minute, 30 in January. So even for me, this is all a relatively new phenomenon. Yeah, obviously from America, imported, as but, most um, things are. Yeah, but, as um, most things are. Yeah, yeah, uh, but it is. <laughs> I'm, I'm loath to give credit to these people that are doing it because uh, I hate them with a passion. Yeah, um, sure. But the job that they've done, they've been really clever in the way that very they've clever. done it. Really clever in the way they've done it. Yeah. They're doing it very, very gradually. So most people don't actually understand that what is happening in their lives, what, what, what is being taken from them. Not Most people don't understand it because it's being done so gradually. Uh, and they do it very cleverly, and they use false flags, uh, and they're, they're really clever about the way they go about things. Um, and so I guess you, you kind of have to give them a bit of credit, but um, <laughs> but I still hate them. Yeah. COVID-19 plagued our television screens, social media timelines, radios, and the newspapers. For the first time in a long time, or at least since the dawn of the climate scare, the entire human race was told that they were facing the same threat and was tasked to work together to put an end to it. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Millions of Americans staying at home are relying on Amazon. Are you frightful for the future? Um, or nervous? I don't know what the correct word is. I don't think I am. Um, no? I, I, I feel like there's way more good people on this planet than there is bad and eventually everybody will realize what's been done to them and they will come together uh, and they will kick out the psychos who are doing this to us yeah that's that's my optimist in me um, but I, I, but there's you know there's seven eight billion of us on this planet um but i think there's only a very small percentage of those that are really evil people yeah. So once everybody realizes, we outnumber them by a heck of a lot. Yeah. yeah. And they will be, they will be the frightful ones. There's talk of uh, potential mandates coming back. I mean, America have already started showing signs with Joe Biden um, and I believe his wife, Jill, who's, I, th I believe <laughs> Biden's been masking indoors already. I think I read the other day. Do you reckon it will come back to here in the UK? I see this actually as as quite a positive sign. Okay. And I'll tell you why. Because they, they went through the whole bit with the mandates. They got the mandates kicked out in mm -hmm. this country eventually. Yeah. So I think they then tried the monkey pox yeah. scare. Yeah. People ignored that, mm -hmm. went away. Uh, they're going for it with the climate hoax. Yeah. Um, most people have seen through that, I think. Yeah. And I think this is their last desperate throw of the dice to bring back COVID. Yeah. To see if they can get the people under control again. I, I don't. I think there's too many people that will not go along with it this time. Yeah. I really do. Uh, there's so many people now that you know. Three years ago, I was speaking to thought I was mental. Um, who are now going? Blimey, you were right. I'm not going to comply with that nonsense again. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'd be very surprised if. Uh, if they got away with that again. Let's let's talk about that then, because um, I'm right in saying that you speaking out against all of this, um, all of the stuff, really affected family life. Yeah, I mean, um, <laughs> I think some of my family thought that I'd gone a bit mad. Because um, you said, I think you said recently that um, they said that you had mental health issues for having just having a different opinion. 
Uh, yeah, I mean, they were, they were worried for me. Um, they did. They, they thought that, that I'd gone a bit loopy. <laughs> uh, despite my assurances and the fact that, you know, everything that I spoke about, I had pretty rational arguments for. Yeah. Uh, and I wasn't kind of really extreme in my views at all. Um, but eventually, you know, as things transpired and the things that I was talking about, they saw coming to fruition, um, things that I'd warned them about. Uh, they then, you know, eventually came around and went, oh, blimey. Actually, yeah, you you actually knew what you were talking about back then. Yeah. Um, and it's been fine. And I, the thing, I didn't fall out with anybody over it. You know, it would have been easy for me to have just like got mad at them and not mm. speak to them anymore. I, I never felt fell out with anybody um, over my views. Uh, I was always calm and rational. And if people disagreed with me, that's fine. Uh, you know, I. I'm quite uh, happy for people to have a different opinion. Of course. It doesn't bother me. I'm not going to cancel them because they have a different <laughs> opinion to me. Yeah, I found that's what, what some people were trying to do to me. You know? yeah. It's like, that's a bit weird. Um, but I kept calm and uh, I didn't lose my rag. And eventually time is, uh, uh, is great for, you know, people being proved right. And uh, a lot of the stuff that a lot of people were talking about in 2020, even before vaccines have been mentioned sure um you know a lot of people were talking about you know the the, the vaccines the um our digital id sure all that kind of stuff um and you know you're not going to be able to be traveling unless you're vaccinated and all of a sudden all these things started being implemented and it was like there you go okay i, I warned you and yeah. you didn't listen um so you know i'm not the mad one how did that make you feel that you know because I've had a I've had a similar experience. It's, it, mostly, it's with um, friends, quote unquote. Because you know, after speaking out against this sort of thing, um, I had a, kind of a similar thing. But how how did that make you feel at the time when you know they were saying stuff like that? Um, I was pretty calm about it all, really, because I I think I knew uh, in time as as things panned out. Uh, I knew that I, I was pretty certain that I'd be proved mm -hmm. um, to be on the right side of history. Mm -hmm. um, and the reaction that I get now in the street when I go to events and things, and, and you know, I was at, at Cheltenham earlier on this year and it was, it was brilliant. You know, the, the amount of people that came up to me and, and thanked me for speaking out, you know, it was just so heartwarming. I didn't have yeah. a single person come up to me in public uh, at Cheltenham and, and slagged me off in any way, shape or form. Everyone that came up was really supportive of what I'd so done. Good. It, was, it was a wonderful feeling. Yeah. So the reason I believe that we're all here today is because we care. Yeah. We care about people getting injured and we care about people dying. And this has happened all because these guys were coerced with military grade psychological operations into taking this new gene therapy technology. Never a class issue. Nope. Uh, it was, because it, it transcended everything. And it's not, it's not an intelligence issue either, because no. some, of my, some of my people, my friends who I thought were the most intelligent people I knew, uh, fell for it hook, line and sinker. Yeah. You know, and, and weren't able to see through the propaganda. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and you know, I get it. Um, as I said before, it was a pretty comprehensive set of propaganda that was thrown at us. Mm. And, uh, and I understand why people fell for it, uh, because it was just 24-7 yeah. battering. It was military grade. Repetition, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely military grade. And, and there, are, there have been crimes against humanity committed without a shadow of a doubt. Mm. Uh, and I just hope that I'm still around uh, to see these people tried and put behind bars for it. I think many people share that that view, many, many people. And I think it's not just in the UK as well, America, yep. New Zealand, Canada. Funny that. The Five Eyes just... country seems yeah. to have been the worst. It's, yeah. I mean, Funny when you that. look into it, uh, there's so many things that were so dodgy and mm. uh, forgotten about so many of it, so much of it, because yeah. it was just one thing after another. And it's just been an absolute battery. And you've got to be really, uh, you've got, I think you've got to have a real calmness about you to be able to take it all in, not get overwhelmed by it, 
Um, and also, uh, at the same time, still understand that you've got a life to live. You we're only here once. Uh, you exactly. know, you've got a life to live. You've still got to try and make the most of it. You know, still try and be as happy as you possibly can be. Mm -hmm. You know, I probably early on, uh, I probably went too far and I kind of neglected my family a little bit because I was overwhelmed with what I was seeing early on. Right. Uh, and I really kind of got a bit obsessed with it and, and kind of was doing research all over the place. Um, and, and kind of during the lockdowns and everything, I kind of neglected the family a little bit. And, and that was something that I had to check myself okay. and go, right, hang on a minute. This is, you're doing too much of that. You're not spending enough time with your family. Got you. I had to withdraw from that a little bit and just get a better balance in my life. And my wife was brilliant for that. She was the one that was kind of keeping me in check and going, hang on a minute, we've got a daughter in the house here. You need yeah. to be present for her as well. Uh, and she was absolutely right. And uh, and so I've managed to get that, that balance in life now. And you mentioned um, your family have come around to you to to everything that's been obviously panning out. Yeah, well, they've stopped taking, so that's a good start. That's a good start. Uh, um, <laughs> so yeah, uh, thankfully. Um, and, you know, I, I've, I've stood firm in what I believed in. Um, I wasn't, I don't think I was uh, particularly nasty about anything. No. Uh, I was quite calm about it all. And if people didn't agree with what I was saying, that was fine. But I needed them to hear what I had to say so that they could then make up their own mind. And if they, if after hearing me, they still wanted to go with the propaganda that was coming out of television, that's absolutely fine. But as long as you hear me out and give me the respect to hear me out and then make your own mind up. So to wrap up then, uh, for the final question, what's in store for Matt Letizia now, now that it's stepped into the strange world of politics, <laughs> current affairs and talking all, um, <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't really know where my where what direction my life's going to go in next, and that's the that's, that's the, the great thing about life. Yeah, you just yeah. I've never been one to kind of make, you know, massive plans weeks in advance. You know, I take each day as it comes, and whatever will be will be. Um, all I know is that I will continue to say what I think, mm -hmm. um, speak out against the issues that I think need speaking out against. Um, where that takes me. I'm, I'm relaxed about that. I'll go wherever, I'll go with the flow. Um, and uh, yeah, I just try to lead my best life, have a balance in my life, make sure that I still have plenty of enjoyment, uh, and I do. Uh, I love my golf and uh, yeah. you know that, that brings me great joy and uh, great peace as well, being, mm. there, being out on a golf course with you know just you and your mates and having a chat and playing a sport you love is pretty cool. Um, and yeah, whatever else comes, then I'll take that in my stride. I'll give it my best shot, and uh, hopefully we uh, we come out the other end. And eventually, we get a, a government that actually cares about its own people and not about the people that are controlling it above them. Uh, and that, I guess, is the ultimate would be the ultimate win. We're pretty simple creatures, aren't we? Yep, men. <laughs> like we don't really ask for that much, really, do we? I don't think so. I don't think so. <laughs> Just want people in, in positions of power to actually care about the people below them sure. and not worry about what they're doing to the people above them. Um, sure. Uh, that's kind of the, the end goal, really. Mm. Um, and hopefully we can, we can find a way to get good people in power and not the corrupt ones that we've got at the moment. Yeah. Matt Letizia, thank you so much. You're welcome, mate. Good to meet you. Yeah, and you. Thank you. Pleasure. Pleasure.